So good morning again. We're getting ready to get started. Uh, welcome to day two. Effective management part one is going to be a part two, and then there's going to be a part three. Part one and part two is going to be information, some questions. Uh, part three is like a question and answer session. You can ask everything you want to ask, and, and, uh, and they're going to take notes and get that information to you. This is, I'm excited um, to have this session. We all deal with grants. We all deal with uh, deliverables and all the other stuff that goes along with it. Um, today, we have Mrs. Marsha Perkins. We have Jamie. Jamie, that's Jamie Bob. That's my last name. <laughs> okay. And then we have Donald Good and Bear here with us from the Divisions and Grants Management. Let's give them a hand. Okay, so Marsha Perkins joined the Indian Health Services as the Director of the Division of Grants Management in April of 2022. Where she oversees 300 million in federal financial awards. She has served 23 years in the federal government working with three different agencies where she utilized her expertise in grants management, program development, and performance evaluation. Drawn on her experiences teaching high school and college, she has provided professional development to individuals and organizations on various topics, including creating performance measures, conducting effective technical reviews and marketing strategies for a nonprofit organization. Marsha has contributed to numerous grant publications across the federal government and served as a member of the Department of Homeland Security's Grant Certification Board. She has recently, she was recently nominated and selected for the first IHS Executive Leadership Program. Marsha has a BS in Business Marketing and an MS in Education. Marsh is a member of the Zeta Phi Beta. I have to be excited about that. Uh, sorority and her chapter's executive board. Marsh is a mentor to young girls and volunteers her time to her church and several other community organizations. She is married and has two young adults, both college graduates and one energetic Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> okay. All right. Next, we have Mr. Ms. Clark. Is a grants manager off for the Division of Grants Management. In this role, she signs off from all the federal awards for Indian Health Services after ensuring all requirements are met. I need to like take you to lunch, make sure everything is good. Um, these leads to the father leadership of these men and helps oversee the grants management specialists in their role. Jamie, last name? Yarn Bob. That's right. <laughs> um, joined the Division of Grants Management in 2023. Uh, coming uh, from an HSS office for civil rights, operation and resources division where she worked in human resources and special projects. Throughout her career, Jamie worked in various offices, including United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, Office of Director, Service Center Operations, and Office of Citizenship. I didn't even know they had all these offices. Did y'all? Oh. Okay, all right. All right. She enjoys working with grants because Director Pat they make within the communities. Prior to her time with the federal government, she was an association meeting plan. Okay, last but not least, Donna Goodman is a grant management specialist for the Indian Health Services with 20 years of federal grants administrative experience and professional certification from management concepts. Donna enjoys providing customer service, grant assistance, and interpreting federal laws to recipients and stakeholders. Donald, is a lead for staff development and training and currently manages a portfolio of grants that include Healthy Lifestyles, the SDPI program. How many SDPI recipients do you have in A lot of us have given them. Uh, SDPI, Special Diabetes Program for Indians, um, Suicide Prevention Intervention and Postvention, and Urban Indian Health Services. Thank them again for coming, give them a hand, and mark the team. Teacher and me is gonna yell uh, and talk loud. <laughs> Don't understand it when it's quiet. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I, I have to tell you, um, I joined IHS in April of 2022. Now I walked into a lot of challenges and opportunities for us. And I, one of the things that I wanted to do for sure is to commit to not only our partners, which are you, the recipients, our federal staff, 
and my own team, we're going to make some changes and they're going to be good and they're going to be positive. And the only way we can do that is we go out and get to know the people that we serve because we work for you. That is the truth. We work for you and we take our jobs very seriously. Um, I love grants. I've been doing grants. I'm aging myself. <laughs> the gray hairs will show through my grades, but at least 22 <laughs> years. And I've done all kinds of mandatory, discretionary, work with the states, work with the tribes, nonprofit, church, social, whatever. I've done. And I love it. And I'm so happy to be here to serve Indian country and all the Alaska natives. So we're going to do a couple things today. This is our first time out as a team. And I have a phenomenal team here. <laughs> I'm so happy to be able to take them out. But I want to tell you what we're going to be doing. And we're going to be doing this across the country. Going out and telling you what's the most important things. Now, you know, we are federal agents, if you will. We have to hold things and recipients accountable when it comes to rules. But I'm also of the understanding that sometimes the rules are not very clear. And that's why we have to come out and talk to you and give you some understanding of what that means. But I'm also really big on technical assistance. The more you contact us, the more we can find out what those issues are. What's the problems? What's the questions? And where do we need training? Um, let me just tell you a couple of things that I've done since, since April. We now have three teams. We have a policy team. And our policy lead, Jamie, is here. Um, what we do is we looked at some of the questions that we were getting from all of the GMS. And it was questions about low cost extension, questions about supplements, questions about what is allowed to cost, can we use food, depending on the programs, right? And so what we wanted to do is create a, a database that we have at any point you can call us and get an answer from our GMS. And we also wanted to make sure that we're sending out things for you to know, like we sent out recently how to change uh, change in scope. We sent out no cost extension. We've uh, we've sent out at least six of them, and she can talk about that. I'm still on her thunder. Um, she'll tell you more. About still, I tend to do that, guys. <laughs> all over the page. And then I have this too, and I'm not even with that, but it's all. Um, and so then we have a training team. Now you should be receiving, and if you don't receive it, then you know I want to know. We've been sending out all of the training that our partners provide to you, which is grant solutions, as well as payment management system. We've done so far at least six, and we have about nine trainings left for I think the next two months. So you should be getting all of that. And, and they're rolling, you can join them. We record them, you can go on our website, get the recordings and see the training. So if you are a manager here, please, 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 Share with the staff, share with your stakeholders all of the things that we're doing because it's right there on our website. And then we have a very general mailbox, um, DGM at IHS.gov. You can always email me directly and ask me a question. That's the kind of service that we're going to be providing for you um, sometime in the week. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I've kind of talked about that. I'm going to quickly go through next slide. This is what we're going to do today. So this is our um, basic general effective grants management PowerPoint. And it's going to cover a lot of topics that's very important to recipients. But I think also as staff, you need to understand some of the concepts so when you're getting questions. So we're going to take, take you through this very general. And if you have specific questions, if you can just write them down and hold them, we will address them. We're going to repeat this same session, session two. But then on session three, it's, it's a free for all. If you have very specific questions, we have our computers. I think we have access to all the databases. That whole session is dedicated for questions. So bring them, and I understand there are some <laughs> Bring them, we're ready for you. Okay, so this is the agenda we're gonna cover. Um, and then I'll come back and talk about little, some of the resources and some of the federal partner staff. And that's it, that's how we're gonna go. Next slide. You've already met the team. We are now 13 strong as of this week. We onboarded one other staff. So I have 13. <laughs> I'm begging for more because we have over 30 programs going on at one time. We have 500 and some recipients in the system, and we process 1,300 actions. Wow. So <laughs> my team is small but mighty. So we do ask that you. You know, be patient with us sometimes because 
For example, Donald is a grants management specialist. He has about four grant programs, but now he's being a backup grants management officer. He's also leading the team with better training in for the grants uh, specialist staff. I'm pulling him wherever I need him. <laughs> and that's how we work on our team. So next slide. Okay, this is and this is very basic, and I'm sure. I don't know how many of you are very like very new to grants. Like if you're like yes, under like three years, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, okay, okay. I'm gonna talk to you then. All right. So this is the grants management cycle. I'm gonna talk to you like I would tell someone who doesn't know grants very well. Think of the grants world from our perspective. There's a pre-award and there's a post-award. Pre-award is all of the activities that happen before you give the money. Post award is anything after you get money. So, so pre award for us. I think we're old. Like twenty years old. We need a new graphic. That's anything. But pre award activities for us means that as the administrative arm for IHS. We are working with any program in IHS. They may say, hey, DVM, we want to do this new program. We just got $10 million. And we want to focus it on opioid addiction, another aspect of it. So they come to us and we say, okay, here's the template to develop the criteria. And these are the things you must do. Now, in the meantime, we have to take that notice of funding opportunity and we have to clear it with general counsel, with our evaluation arm at I, um, HHS and IHS. We have to send it to the department. We have to send it to OMB. And then once it's approved, we send it through a clearance process. And it's about 15 steps that we have to clear. So when a NOFO starts right here, it takes about maybe six months to get actually ready to publish. So that's all pre-award. Once it's published, we then send it back to the program office who's going to do it, and then they have to have a technical review, and that's where they recruit reviewers, and then all the applications, well, before they recruit reviewers, we actually have to we have to post it on grant.gov, and that's where most of the, any federal uh, grant we're looking for is on grant.gov. That's the one system we use. We've heard a lot of feedback, but we do not manage grants that's outside of HHS. However, we utilize that as the system where anyone can get information about grants. So once they get the information, it's published, we put out a lot of communication, applicants apply, we do a technical review where the application is scored, they rank it. We are monitoring all of this process. So while this is going on for one program, more than likely we're doing it for about 15 or 20 at any time. So once, this is still pre-award, once it's awarded, it's announced, it's put out there, you have the tribes, you have the service units, whoever got the grant. We assign them a grant management specialist. That's one specialist on the grant side, one on the program side. They work with you, they monitor you, they issue your notice of award, they answer your questions, they review your budget, they're with you the entire period. So a lot of people think, that oh I should go to the area office and get questions asked and you should however when it comes to the financial and administrative aspect of the grant you should always come to the grants management specialist that you're assigned and this is what I have seen over the years usually the organization or tribe will put one person because normally we only have a couple uh, people that you can put in grant solutions as your primary but you want that person to be the one that's able to usher the information. And by that, I mean, they're able to talk to the grants management specialist as well as the program specialist. So always think about who is that person that we want in grant solutions. It shouldn't be someone that doesn't check grant solutions. It should be someone who's checking grant solutions daily and checking payment management system. So always think about who is that person and if they're not checking and they're not providing information to the staff, you may want to pull them out. Okay, so now we're in the, the post award. Now, I'm going to be all transparent here. Um, IHS has not 
in the last 10 years done much monitoring. Either side, program side or administrative side, at least division of grants management, I'm gonna speak for that. They have not gone out to do monitoring. Monitoring is just the ability to go out, see if the funds are being used according to what the applicant, the tribe, or the organization proposed to do. It's an accountability check. It's also an opportunity for us to do technical assistance. I used to write, and we're writing it now, um, monitoring is a great way to build a relationship with the stakeholders. You can't do that if you don't go out. I said this to senior staff, I said this to the program office. So we are developing the tool for IHS where we can work with the pro program office and the uh, DGM will come out, we will do monitoring and we will also come out to the area offices to help train them to do it as well. It's a big piece. And I wanna say since I sat on, it's called the CGM, Chief Grants Management Officers, Every opt-in in HHS has it, NIH, HRSA, um, SAMHSA. All of us meet once a month, and the secretary and the deputy secretary have issued some initiatives for us for all grant programs, monitoring and accountability. And the reason is, it should be happening anyway, right? Should be monitoring the funds. <laughs> you should, we want the work to get done. But in order to do that, we have to have accountability. And so that's one of the areas that we are strengthening within um, DGM. So the monitoring is coming soon. We, we have to clear it through the department, through general counsel. Jamie is our lead on that. But again, we're in post award. These are the things that happen after the award is given. And then I think I have a third really quick. The last piece I'll say is close out. Now, I know there's a lot of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> we're closing out grants. So let me tell you what that means for us. If it's a two-year grant, three-year grant, four-year grant, five-year grant, doesn't matter. It has to be closed out. What that means is when you get a, a award, notice of award, it says on there, it starts here and it ends here. That's called a period of performance. A lot of people get this mixed up because they think that during this period of performance, after it's ending, I can keep going and I can keep going. And that is a misnomer in the department. And I wanna tell you why. Just because it wasn't closed out doesn't mean that the grant didn't win. Because if the notice of award is for five years, the grant ended. What happens and what's been happening here is a lot of times people will need <clears throat> a little more time, no cost extension. And I've heard people say rollover. Well, grants don't roll over. They just get extended for a period of time. Now, I'm going to speak to SCPI, and then I'm going to turn this over to my team. Prior to, I don't know if they like it, prior to becoming, um, the grant was not closed out. There was COVID. A lot of things were happening, right? The grant started when? Originally, 20 some years ago? Right? It was supposed to be for five years. What happened, it wasn't closed out because no one closed it out. Wasn't that it wasn't supposed to be closed out? It wasn't an emphasis for the for the agency. In other words, no one was saying, hey, where are your closeouts? Where are your closeouts? However, all grants have to be closed out. So what that did, that 20 year law of quote unquote rollover cause all the numbers on IHS to skyrocket. So this year, I, myself, and the director were on a call with the deputy secretary of HHS. And she wants to know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> we're gonna close the grants out. All of those old grants were closed out, except if you had a no cost extension. So that, I know that was a lot of buzz about that because we were getting a lot of questions about it. But I just want, if one message you can remember, grants are supposed to get closed out. Recipients are supposed to spend money. You're gonna hear that a lot within the time. And we need your help to help us get there because we don't wanna see our numbers um, go up again. Uh, in May, and Denise Clark is our GMO. She was the lead. I asked her to do this project and make sure we get it down. 
we had 782 older grants, 732 grants that weren't closed out. We got them down to two. <laughs> and the only reason we had to is because they were very, very older programs with another agency. But I just want you to get in the habit with us because we're in this together. We're going to close out these grants. We're going to help recipients and help yourselves get through those five years. We are trying to make it better. And I'm all for reducing the burden. Trust me, I broke grants. I understand that paperwork. <laughs> I understand trying to get that 425 uploaded, and we want to look at some of those areas. I understand the no cost. We're looking right now at the non-competing because I'm like, I don't want to give all this these list of things for you to do when you don't need to do them every year. So I'm really, they know me. Let's reduce, let's reduce wherever we can. So you're going to see a lot of stuff coming out from us. Don't worry, if you don't understand, just call us, we'll explain it to you. But we're going to send out a lot of alerts about how um, the processes are going to change to make it better for you. So that is kind of the closeout discussion, and I think that's pretty much all the cycles. If you ever have um, any, I say, suggestions for uh, grant improvement, we are open to it. We just have to make sure that it uh, falls within our regulations. We always go with the two CFR, and I know that's the legalese talk. But you can always find our grant regulations on our website. We always look at OMB circulars. That's what guides our grant processes. And then we have a thick, I brought it to HHS grant policy. So sometimes we have to look at all three to confer to make sure that they make sense. And then we have to interpret that. So you, you'll hear a little bit more about that. But please, I just want to convey to you before I sit down. We are here for you. We are here to help. We are here to help make things better for you. We want them to be better for you. And we're looking at other ways for bringing you into the discussion. So please, please, please take advantage of all the resources that we are offering and let us know. Okay. Who am I turning to? Jane? <laughs> take it away, Jane. You got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Four steps. I don't know. I probably like you did a whole bunch of different things. So I apologize for repeating myself. That did about to happen. Um, we're going to start with talking about the type of IHS awards. IHS has two types of awards, grants and cooperative agreements. The important thing to remember about that is cooperative agreements have a significant amount of mm -hmm. the award uh, with the agency, whereas grants do not have that kind of involvement. Um, next slide, please. When you get your award, you're going to get a notice of award. You'll often hear us refer to this as an NOA. We call it a NOAA. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to have all of your outline of obligations, all of your expectations. It is your guidance as to what you're going to do. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I know this is really small and hard to read. I apologize. My technological abilities did not allow me to make that any bigger. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, but this is what your notice of award looks like. This is page one. On page one, the important things you're going to want to look at. Line one is the recipient's name. It's going to have your information. Um, it's also going to have your key personnel in line seven and eight. Those are the people Marcia was referencing who are going to be the people you want that are going to relay down to where it needs to go. And that is your project director and your authorizing. Sometimes it's called representative, sometimes it's called official, we sort of use them interchangeably. Um, line 10 is gonna be your program official's information. Line nine is me, your GMS, or Donald, your GMS. Um, that's where you're gonna to want to contact if you have questions regarding financial, financial information, administrative things. Line 19 is your budget period. That's usually the one year period uh, for one of my grants that is April 1st to March 31st of the following year. Uh, 125 is your total approved funding amount. Line 26 is your period of performance for your project period. And that is, as Marcia mentioned, the entirety of the grant. So in my case, for my grants, it's five years. Line 30 is the next one that everyone dislikes. It's remarks. 
Remarks can be anything from uh, this approves your grant to here are your restrictions on drawing down your funds. Uh, next scene. This is page two. Page two has line 33, which is your detailed budget. So it goes through all of the things you put in your narrative and exactly what they're supposed to be. I know for some recipients, if this does not match what was in their project outline, their uh, agency won't let them drop their funds. So be sure you pay attention to that so you don't delay being able to access it. Next slide. This is where your programmatic plan is on. It's gonna have all of your terms and conditions of the award. It's gonna have your reporting deadlines, be they programmatic or financial. Uh, it's also gonna have any of your program requirements. Next slide, please. And this is just a detail of all of that so that you have it for reference. So if I look at that team, team, time, 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 time. Next slide. And next slide. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, under your remarks is going to be your restrictions. This is something that you'll want to pay close attention to. A restriction is basically you've been awarded your money. But here's an amount you may not draw down yet. <clears throat> and that can be for any, any type of reason. Um, it's going to have the amount of your restriction. It's going to have the reason for the restriction and how or what you have to do to remove the restriction. Restrictions aren't always bad. Sometimes you, can call it, you simply need to provide an updated indirect cost rate agreement. Pretty easy. Other times it's because there are things listed in your budget like food or entertainment, which we can't pay for. Uh, you're also gonna have restrictions for things like your audit is missing and you need to you know, provide an updated audit report. So it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's very easily resolvable. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, program, programmatic terms and conditions can be anything from you have to work with X amount of community organizations as part of your grant. You need to provide professional development. You need to attend a conference. It's also gonna list your deadlines for submission of reports uh, into your data portal. And uh, sometimes there's other things. If it's, uh, they may wanna revise your scope, they may wanna work with you on some of your projects, but they don't wanna delay awarding the money. So they'll put those kind of changes in the programmatic terms as well. Next slide, please. Standard terms and conditions contain everything. It outlines uh, the responsibilities for program officials. It outlines the responsibilities of the grants management specialists. It has all of the, as Marsh mentioned, two CFR code, all of the legalese that are required to contain in there, um, OMB cost principles, Grant payment info, a lot of the other things I've mentioned and some of the other things like reporting dates and things like that are reiterated for this question. You will receive a revised notice of award if you do make a change or an update, such as you update your key personnel, um, trying to think about things. Uh, budget changes, things like that. You will get a revised notice of award, um, and that will be issued through Grant Solutions. And you'll get an email that says you have a new NOAA. You can just go in the system and download it. One thing I was going to add, I'm going to do that from here, okay? So you can take a breath, but I know you would like one. I was going to say one thing I would always suggest with the uh, NOA is again, this is coming through the system. So you need to share that with the key people because we have seen that maybe one person understands what's in there and the restrictions. But then we'll get a call from maybe a finance person said, well, I don't know what this is. So we always recommend whoever is in the grant solutions designated for your organization. This information needs to be shared around even to your leadership. Because a lot of times we'll get calls or the director's office will get called and say, hey, we understand we have a restriction. We, we can't get access to our money. Why? And we go right to the NOA and say, well, so-and-so got this NOA. It's in the system. Why are they asking about it? It's clearly outlined there. So again, sharing information is key in the organization. Thank you, Marcia. 
As my lovely big font word says, always review your terms and conditions. There's a lot of information in there and it will answer a lot of questions for you. Um, that you, you know, you're still welcome to ask us questions, but it might answer some questions before that. Um, next slide, please. The big thing with financial requirements to remember is there are two, I always get tongue twisted, federal financial reports. We refer to them as the FFR. It's way easier to say FFR. Uh, and that is the SF-425. You are going to do an annual SF-425, SF uh, 120 days after the end of your budget period. The final FFR is due at the end of your period of performance. And that's due 120 days after the end of the performance period. You will get a notification of that in payment management services, another element suit, we call it MS. Um, <laughs> um, and that will be located in, in, that, in that system for you. Next slide, please. If you don't have, you know, I'm sure you all have financial controls. If you don't, you should. Um, you wanna make sure that you've got internal controls to make sure that your reports are being submitted timely. In some instances, you're gonna to wanna to have a backup person. Life happens, but you're not gonna to wanna to delay um, getting your reports done because that can delay your funding. So if you don't have an account with PMS, they are not, um, they're a federal partner, but we are not able to do that for you. So you would contact them at that information to get this funding. Yes. Next slide, please. We also include some information for how you can get training and what you'll be able to complete once you have uh, completed that training. As I mentioned, they're, they're a partner. So we aren't responsible for that. We can't, unfortunately, coordinate that for you. But that is how you reach them. Next slide, please. Programmatic requirements and deadlines. Any questions for those, you should go directly to your program officer. They're the ones who are going to be able to answer those programmatic questions for you. Um, again, that's box 10 on the NOAA. They are super helpful if they can't answer the question or they feel it's something that uh, they need weigh in or buy in from us. They'll reach out to us, usually include their recipient and reach that. So, uh, next slide, please. Single audit requirements, as I mentioned, those are very, very important. It is actual, actually federal requirements to have completed your single audit if you have spent more than $750,000 in a fiscal year. Single audits are due to the Federal Audit Clearing House, which we call the FAP, <laughs> uh, either 30 days after your audit is received from the auditor or nine months after the fiscal year ends, whichever is earlier. Any specific questions, you can reach them at that information at the bottom. Post-award changes. So Marsha mentioned there's the pre-award phase and there's the post-award phase. In the post-award phase, there are several changes that require prior approval before you move forward and take an action. And those are the change in scope of work, change in key personnel, no cost extensions, carry over requests of 25% or more. That's key, 25% or more. And budget modifications in uh, excess of 25% or more. If it is 25% or less, you do not have to uh, make a change. But 25% or more, you have to have prior approval. I'm going to go through each one of these in the next coming slides. Next slide, please. The first one is change in scope. Change in scope is a change in what you have put in your original application. You want to change direction. In order to do that, you need to have approval from your program office. I'm not going to go through each step, but I included all of the things you'll need to do, and you would make that change, uh, that request, 
as an amendment in your exhibitions. And that details all of the information you would need as well as the steps you would take. As Marshall mentioned earlier, on the DGM Columns and Topics page on our website, we have the common policy items. One of them is change in scope. It directs you everything that we need to do and gives you instructions on how to take care of that. Next slide, please. Change in key personnel. Um, there's a lot of turnover sometimes in, in the grant world. You want to make sure that your key personnel are always updated. Otherwise, we're sending you information and it's going into, yeah, a black space hole and nobody knows what's going on. So we just want to make sure that you submit those in as an amendment in grant solutions as well. Uh, that's simple. Just contact your grants management specialist and they'll send you the steps. Very easy to do. Next slide, please. No cost extensions. Your final budget period is coming to an end and you still have money. You still have things to complete. What do you do? You can apply for an extension up to 12 months, um, but it doesn't have to be 12 months. It can be less than 12 months. Um, you'll need to submit all of the items noted here. And um, that will get reviewed by the grants management specialist as well as the program officer. Next slide, please. I'm not to talk to you guys, but I don't want to talk too slow. <laughs> um, unobligated balances, also referred to as carryover requests. I'm receiving a lot of these right now because it's the end of the period of performance and folks have money they'd like to carry over from year one to year two. So you're required to submit an amendment to show how you're going to use those leftover funds in your next year. You're required to submit a 424A with your line item budget, a copy of your completed SF-425, a budget narrative, a cover letter, with key information on it, um, which is noted in the carryover request policy alert that we have on our website. The most important thing I can tell you, do not spend those funds until you have approval. Because if you don't get approved for some reason, you're gonna have to pay it back. Nobody wants to do that. I don't wanna tell you that you have to do that. <laughs> so, and they'll know it's approved because they'll get an updated notice of award. A lot of times what happens is once we review it, there's a lot of back and forth sometimes. There might be things that might not meet programmatically. So program will say, hey, we need to adjust this. As a GMS, I'll say, that kind of orders on an entertainment expense, and we can't pay an entertainment expense. So could you please readjust for that amount throughout your budget? Very easy, simple back and forth. I promise it's made this. Uh, next slide. Please. This is one point I want to make. So the term carryover, is only used between the grant, the period of performance. Yeah. So you we do not carry over. That's what the point I was making. We do not carry over after the period of performance. We only carry over what's within those five years. So if you had a grant that ended at FY22 and now we just issued FY23, there is no carry over. That's the terminology that we want to help everyone uh, make sure they can understand. At that point, there's no cost extension that were extended from the previous year, but there's no carryover between the, the period of performance in grants. The carryover is from budget period to budget period. Yes. In my case, for my grantees, it is they're just completed year one and now they're into year two. Yes. So they're able to carry those funds over once they get approval. This outlines how to do that. And as I mentioned, there is a policy alert on our website which has all of the same information under DGM, DGM policy products. Um, that concludes me. I sound like the Netflix car guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Denise for her portion. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about um, spending the funds. Now, it sounds easy 
should be easy, but we do have a lot of recipients that are not spending their funds timely. Um, Can you say that again? We have a lot of recipients <laughs> that are not spending their funds timely. The grants management specialists are going into payment management systems and they're going to be monitoring the funds that are in there. If you're in your, uh, your first year, you're figuring your third month and you haven't drawn your many funds, that's a red flag to us. It looks like you're not implementing your project. Um, we don't want large unobligated balances. We don't want a large carryovers because that could lead to offsets. And offsets is if you're in year one and you're going to year two, you may not get year two's funding. You may have to just use year one's funding for year two's expenses. So it's very important that you follow your plan. You know, you hire, you um, draw down your funds quarterly or monthly. Actually, as your bills are coming in, you should be drawing down your funds and spending them. We don't want to go to Congress and request more funds if we have a lot of large unobligated balances during closeout, which happens a lot. <laughs> so the funds that are left over at the end of the budget period or the project period will either be returned to Treasury or back to IHS. So when we're going to Congress and asking for more money, they look and see that you have a lot of unspent dollars and it doesn't look good for the agency. So please follow your plans, hire, hire your people that you're hiring, pay your vendors and spend the dollars that the so community FD, needs. FDPI funds can be used for human resources? Yeah, SDPI for, yeah, for personnel. Yeah. That is an allowable cost. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, what is closeout? So, closeout refers to the end of the grant's life cycle, and everyone is going to experience closeout. Now, as Marsha had mentioned, the department has mandated that we close out our grants within a competitive segment. And a competitive segment normally is five years. So at the end of five years, the recipient has 120 days to submit all of their final reports, liquidate all of their obligations. And we have, as IHS, 180 days to close out the award. So we mentioned that we had, we were on the department's list. We had 732 backlog grants that were not closed out. And we got it down to two. So we're we met our goals. Well, the last two are very hard to close out, but we're working on it. We're going to get them done soon. But now we have implemented procedures that each, each segment is going to be closed out timely. The, the um, grants management specialists are working with your offices and program to make sure that we close out our grants timely. Um, the next slide, please. Grant closeouts. When should you expect notification? So we notify uh, recipients in their last year on the terms and conditions of the notice of award. There's a remark in your terms and conditions that says, this is your final period, final year. Recipients are required to submit A, B, and C. That will be in each um, last, last year award. We also send closeout letters 30, 30 days prior to the closeout of the grant. They were gonna email those. And we also send bulk notifications and grant solutions, So, which is very important. So whoever's monitoring grant solutions, make sure you look at those notifications and let everyone know. Yes. What is, I missed the beginning, maybe you, uh, when is the general um, open for grants period? The general open? application? On the notice of award? Yeah, the no, project. prior, before, like if we're going to apply, is there a usual time of the year when they're open to apply for a grant, for um, this grant? Or competitive grants or for, what is your program? What program do you have? Uh, we don't have one right now. We we just have the well, okay. Indian Health Service. Okay, we, all, we have notice. We have RFA. But you have tribal management grant, I think, up there. When is that usually open? 
Okay. Yeah. Tribal, it, it, it does vary. Tribal management, I think we have a competing tribal management coming up. Right. But you can always, like I say, you can always find whatever is open on our PGM website. Also, the program office who is issuing that grant will send out to the listserv to say, this grant is coming up, it's going to be receiving applications, and you can go to grants.gov. So again, DGM website, the actual program office, whether it's uh, go, um, I, I always say book link them or whatever you bookmark them, um, because we have so many, there's 30 different grant programs, so we can't, I have a list to tell you when they're coming up, but you know, she doesn't work on that part of it. So we have a no for tracker manager. So the best thing to do is keep, you know, tabs to our website and also the, those program offices and grants.gov. Any day you can go in grants.gov and put in tribe and you're gonna get every tribe, tribal um, grant opportunity all across the federal government. But if you put in Indian Health Service tribal grants, then you're gonna get specific IHS. Okay, hope that answers it. But we will always announce at IHS and even the Public Affairs Office. Yeah, they we'll, send out lists, we'll and everything. We'll post it. We on always post it on our website. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. So grant closeout DGM. Well, it's our responsibility to provide guidance on closeout to make sure that we're applying, we're um, complying with the terms and conditions of the award. Uh, we want to make sure that we get accurate documents timely and complete, and we're going to completely close out the award time. Next slide, please. Program responsibility. Well, they're going to one work, work closely with us. They're looking for a programmatic report that has um, five, the final programmatic report. They want to make sure that it's been received and it's reviewed and that it has, it's going to have all the outcomes and evaluations for that program. And then they're going to let us know that we can move forward with closing out the grant. Next slide, please. Okay, what to submit? Well, Three main things that we need, a final FFR, a final PPR, which is a progress report, and a final um, tangible and property report, which is the SF428. Um, the progress report should be submitted in grant, solution, in grant solutions. However, some of the programs have their own portal, and you can submit it to their portal, but the official record is grant solutions, so it needs to be submitted. And grant solutions also. Uh, the next slide, please. These are this is a sample of the forms. The first uh, form of the is the diabetes. So I know there are a lot of diabetes uh, recipients in here. That is their final progress report. Your your progress report may look like that or may not. Um, the one in the middle is the FFR, which is the SF425. That report is what we have a lot of. Um, Term. We have to have, have to help the grantee fill out this report because it must reconcile with payment management systems. It cannot have any unliquidated obligations, and the unobligated balance must be the exact same amount that's in payment management systems. And this last report is the 428, which is the final equipment and supply reports, um, and that is for any. Uh, Unused supplies that has a fair market value of $5,000 or more, or equipment that has a fair market value of $5,000 or more. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, a uh, final progress report. Again, the progress report should be a summary of both positive and negative, the progress for the entire competitive segment, which is normally five years. Um, it should be evaluation on accomplishments toward the programmatic goals and objectives and again, covering the entire project. And it must be uploaded into grant solutions. So when we have our five-year closeout, every year we or every quarter we've been reporting, does that information get pulled into the final or is Oh. It doesn't, but okay. you can pull it into the final because the final should be the entire segment. So you can combine all of those quarterly reports mm -hmm. that you completed into one, one report. Okay. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next slide, please. 
So, okay, final reconciliation. We talked about this a little bit. We cannot have any unliquidated obligations. Um, the unobligated balance must be the exact as what payment management systems have, and it must be marked finally. Next slide, please. Okay, the tangible property report. We talked about this a little bit. It is for any equipment that has a fair market value of $5,000 or more. Um, the supplies, unopened and unused, total value of $5,000 or more. And your organization shall use the equipment and supplies. You can continue to use the project, the, the supplies, as long as you need to. You don't have to return them to, I, to IHS. We actually do not want them back. We prefer that you continue to use them for other HHS supported projects. Um, there is a section on the 428 that you can list the grant number or project period, project that you plan to use the funds for. Um, when the items are no longer needed, you can use it for other, other activities. We prefer that the, the equipment continues to be used for your community. Now, the next I'm slide. Sorry. Can you repeat what you said about the supplies? You, I, I just does not want them. We do not want the supplies back. We prefer that you continue to use the, the supplies or the equipment to support other initiatives. We'll if you do, it. I'm sorry, go ahead, Don. Hold on, hold on. I'm just going to say, if you do have any equipment that's greater than 5,000, you still have to report it on the SF 428 form. So there's two forms. It's an SF 428B, and you're going to indicate that you're going to continue to have equipment that's greater than 5,000. And then there's um, uh, on that form, you just let us know in regards to what project or how you are. Uh, Okay. 5,000 or more, and also supplies 5,000 less. We don't have to do that form. Correct. 5,000 or less, you don't have to report on this form. And it's fair market value also. You don't need to report if it's less than 5,000. And if you want to dispose of items that are greater than 5,000, there's a form 428C as in Charlie. And you um, send that form to us saying we do have items that are five thousand dollars or more that we no longer want or you want to use. We want to dispose of them. You send it to us. We have one hundred and twenty days to tell you how to dispose of those items. Now, if it's five thousand dollars or less, you can retain it. You can sell it with no further obligation to IHS. It's up to you. Oh, for five thousand or less. Retain or sell it? Yes. Do these, um, I'm just kind of thinking with a laptop. I'm sorry, should I wait till no, no, that's fine. Um, so that's under $5,000. Under 5000 And does this need to have a barcode on it from IHS or is it not really IHS's? Okay. No, are you a service yeah. unit? I am a service unit. Okay. <laughs> so I was wondering why would you have a car for the let us get back to you. Okay. Okay. I'll see you in section three. Okay. <laughs> okay. We need to do a little more research, but yeah, this grant money, so I'm pretty sure it's really but it still needs to be accounted for. Yeah. But we'll 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 find out. Okay. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Next slide. Oh, the disposition. We talked about this a little bit. Um, and 428C is in Charlie. If you want to, if you no longer need the items, um, we'll send you how to dispose of it within 120 days. That's the 428C. Now, and this is where we talked about any uh, supplies under five thousand dollars can be with the exception of the service and we'll go back to you on that <laughs> can be disposed of. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Um, now we are required to keep records for three years a uh, minimum. If there are any type of audit issues or litigations that period may be extended until the audits and the litigation has been resolved. 
So we can still close out your records with, with even all the issues going on, but we prefer that you make sure you have your records on file, you submit timely reports and accurate reports so that there will not be a possible debt owed to the government. Next slide, please. Oh, and this is Marsha. Like to you. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll be very quick because I know we're on time. So I kind of talked about the policy alerts. Um, these are coming out now. We sent out at least five or six. Yeah. Um, they're always posted, but you can always go to our website. And I'm referring people to our website a lot because we're doing a lot more posting of information there. So it's a one stop. Um, we will send out, if you have a question about a policy, and this is how we determine what, what policy alert we're going to send out based on a lot of questions that we've been getting. Um, so there's more coming out. Um, these are the ones that have already come out. I, I want to mention something about audits because I'm getting a lot of um, I call agency level requests for audit information for our recipients. And when I have to send forth, I have to send forth how many tribes are outstanding on their audits and things like that. So we want to emphasize that audit compliance is going to be a big thing now. It's coming forth because it's coming down from IG. Um, next slide. All of these are helpful resources, but I think we've already mentioned them. So just again, always refer to your circular. One thing that I did want to, um, I like to get tips. So I, I, I would like everyone to take this tip. If you work with a grant, Go back to your office, print out your NOA, have a meeting, talk to your team, get a calendar and write down all your deliverables so everyone knows when things are due. Make sure they have the right resource and name like the GMS and their PMS. And then make sure they understand how to access our resources. That's probably one of the most helpful ways to get everyone on the same, on the same team. Uh, next slide. Points of contact. DGM, if you can't get a GMS, you can always go to G DGM, well, uh, the website, not website, email address now because we now have a monitor. She's monitoring that. So let's just say you're like Donald was here. So the recipients are probably having a fit because they love Donald. <laughs> and so you can always email there and another GMS will assist. Um, I do want to say before I close my re remarks, uh, I want to thank especially well, first, the invitation. We're really glad to be here. I want to thank uh, Dr. Johnson, who I met over the phone from the area office. We made a connection. Glad to meet you and get, get to know the folks down here. Um, Ms. Ottawa, she's gone, Miller. Mm -hmm. Thank her for this invitation, and especially <laughs> Dietrich Taylor, who helped us get here <laughs> and who thought it was a great idea. Thank you for inviting us. And if you all have other or um, events and you just want us to come out, we do have a uh, travel fund, not a lot, but um, our director is really happy about this. So we're going to be taking pictures and let her know what we can do so we can get more. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to stop now. Yes. I do have a question. Yep. So the question is can speakers, can federal speakers get gifts? Yeah. Less than $25. That's great. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. So, like that. Um, so we, we thank you all so much for coming. We get all of these questions, and and I, I you know, we get calls and stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, let's reach out. She's like, hey, yeah, we'll come. I was like, yeah, do it. So I guess got back to me. You know, before I had this job, that's what people before I started this job, I had to sit in a job for two or something. Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you this, though, uh, this is definitely helping us. Uh, and we do have this for less than $25. So, D, if you don't mind, just bring those up. Would you give them another hand? Please. Jamie, Donald, thank you all for coming. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, and I can't say enough about. Oh, thank you. Uh, one more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I always start. Um, no, but I will, I will say that, uh, you know, 
uh, working with the tribes uh, over the last almost six years now and getting the questions that we get and the stuff that we do. Having support from an organization like Reset that I work for, uh, being able to bring people in and have these conversations is huge. Um, doing a site visit, some of the other stuff that goes on. It's just a part of the work that we do and we're excited to do it. So having said that, thank you all again. Next session starts in just a few minutes. So um, questions, questions. questions. I was just wondering if we can get the slides. Yes, you'll definitely have access to the slides. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're definitely supposed to. All right, and then excited. So come back with your questions. Session, session. Second session starts in now. <laughs> <laughs>